Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Gordon Hansen. I'm director of the Center on Global Transformation. Uh, and it's, it's my pleasure to welcome you here uh, for our public lecture by Edna Jaime. Uh, Edna is here with us as a Pacific Leadership Fellow. Uh, the Fellows Program is the flagship enterprise of the Center on Global Transformation, uh, which is made uh, uh, possible by a visionary gift by Jonah Norwin Jacobs. Uh, the goal of this program is to bring thought leaders from Latin America and from Asia to campus so that they can, they can let us know what are the burning issues of the day uh, in their countries uh, and we can communicate to them uh, the advances that we've made uh, in our research um, and play a role in helping addressing some of those policy uh, challenges. Um, uh, uh, Edna Jaime's work, for, uh, for those for the many of you here who, who know it well, um, is something that uh, uh, coincides very tightly with how we approach uh, trying to address uh, global challenges at, at UCSD. Uh, what's distinguished uh, Edna's work is to try and address um, uh, fundamental issues at the core of, of creating a civil society uh, in a manner that is evidence-based, uh, in a manner that uh, focuses on the creation of institutions that can be long-lasting, um, uh, and in a manner uh, that, in, that incorporates uh, different segments of society and listens to those segments uh, in the design of those uh, institutions. Um, it's no surprise that she acquired that uh, uh, approach, uh, having gotten her early training at ITAM. Um, uh, ITAM and uh, UC San Diego share a very strong evidence and in, an in institution and evidence-based uh, approach to understanding the way in which uh, uh, the world operates. Um, uh, uh, Edna spent a good chunk of, of her career uh, before uh, founding uh, uh, Mexico Ibalua uh, at CIDAC, the Center for Research and Development, which is a leading uh, private sector think tank uh, in Mexico, um, which uh, has been at the forefront of de developing uh, a sophisticated analysis of public policy trends um, uh, using uh, evidence to inform uh, the design uh, and the testing of public policy. At, uh, at Mexico Ibalua, uh, which Edna, uh, Edna, uh, Edna grew to, uh, uh, to lead uh, CIDAC before departing uh, to, uh, uh, to create um, and lead uh, Mexico Ibalua. Um, so the, the, uh, her, her current challenge is to try and identify ways in which, um, in which Mexico can find a solution to the problems that are, are plaguing the country uh, in the security domain. Uh, the challenge here is just figuring out what exactly the dimensions of the security problem, uh, the security problems are. You can read the newspaper, and you're going to get only some of the evidence. Uh, the security situation in Mexico has gotten to the point that uh, relying on news to understand what's going on in the world is problematic uh, because the actors involved manipulate uh, the provision of that news. So how we've got to start is with an understanding is uh, of, of what, are, what are the facts uh, on the ground, how do we measure the security situation, and how do we involve the public security forces uh, in that uh, measurement. Uh, uh, once we have that information at hand, then we can think about how we design policies that help Mexico progress uh, out of a situation in which the security situation in parts of the country, um, by, uh, by, uh, by no means all of the country, has become uh, uh, has become quite dire. So this um, uh, uh, this innovative approach uh, blends uh, research. It blends a deep understanding of the foundations of civil society, uh, and it blends an understanding that unless you bring unless you show uh, the important actors that they have a stake in making change, um, and that you can shame them into making change by bringing evidence to bear on their successes and their failures um, that, uh, that we're not gonna make, uh, that we're not gonna make progress. Um, so it's, uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what Edna has to, to say. We got a chance to hear uh, uh, with her uh, an informal talk with students last week uh, about the process of her professional development. Um, uh, and so it's my great pre uh, pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Edna with us today. After her public uh, remarks, uh, uh, Craig McIntosh 
uh, will then have a few things to say, um, and uh, and will then um, uh, uh, will then lead us in uh, in a discussion. So Edna, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much, uh, Gordon, for your kind words, and thank you very much for this kind invitation. It is an honor to be here at UCSD to talk about Mexico, its challenges, and the work that Mexico Evalua is doing to propose viable public policy solutions. In this presentation, as Gordon said, I would like to address the issue of public security. I am sure that all of you have heard of the situation that Mexico is going through in terms of public security. Mexico drops to mine to mind images of a lawless nation, one where police and criminals are often colluded, a place where people do not report crime out of fear or of mistrust. And while this image has a lot of truth behind, it is also misleading. It portrays Mexico as a nation facing a single an identifiable security problem, drug-related violence. The fact that drug-related violence has been concentrated in the northern border of the states for many years explains why this is the predominant portrayal in American media. But the truth is that while fear of crime is pervasive in all of Mexico, People in some metropolitan areas are much more likely to die from a heart attack or a car accident than, than a stray bullet from a cartel crossfire. Today, I would like to share with you three main ideas. One, Mexico does have a security crisis. Though we want, we can hide it. Two, the security crisis does not have a single cause and does not have a single bullet solution. And three, Mexico Evalua found evidence that points to the fact that multiple local level crime and violence prevention strategies are needed in different cities across the country. Let me start doing a brief comment of where do we come from and where do we, do we stand now. Mexico face, and I will dare to say is still facing, the perfect storm in terms of violence and insecurity. A combination of factors came together to create the dire security crisis Mexico is still facing. First, and I think the most important, the historic weakness of state institutions, particularly the criminal justice systems due to years of negligence and corruption. Second, the exponential growth of, of transnational criminal organization. Drug trafficking is the most notorious of their activities, but they also specialize in a wide range of criminal enterprises, including human trafficking, smuggling of material goods, sexual slavery, money laundering, car theft, identity theft, and many others. Third, easier access to wep weapons. Criminal organizations have firepower that often dwarfs that of local law enforcement agencies. This allows them to gain control of many urban areas. This perfect storm exposed all the shortcomings and flaws of the Mexican state. The lack of professional police forces, particularly at the municipal and state levels. 
Let me just give you a number to illustrate the point. As you can see in the slide, more than 60% of the respondents of the National Survey of Victimization said they have little or no trust in both the state and the municipal police uh, uh, from 2011 to 2015, the years we have these measurements available. The weakness of the judiciary system plagued by inefficiency and, inefficiency and corruption. For example, more than 60% of respondents classify the judiciary authorities in Mexico as corrupt. Also important is the lack of a strong social capital, low interpersonal confidence, lack of strong civil society organizations, etc. The rise in homicide rates is the single most worrisome effect of this new reality. Starting in the 90s, early 90s, the homicide rate experienced a sharp decrease until the mid-2000s. In fact, as you can see in the chart, from 2007 to 2011, Mexico entered into a new stage on, of unprecedented violence. Homicide rates at the national level went from 8% to, to more than 23% of 100,000 inhabitants. This is more than a 65% increase. Though we have seen a decrease in homicide rate, it is a worrisome fact that in the last year and the first months of the present one, this tendency has reversed. Public policy theory states that when a democratic society faces a problem that can be solved through government intervention, public and political debate should help find the most agreeable, practical, and effective solution. Unfortunately, in Mexico, public and poli political debate is far away from helping the nation overcome its wave of violence. You have probably heard the old tale of the six blind men who come across an elephant. One of them touches the tusk and thinks it's a spear. Another feels the elephant's side and thinks it's a wall. And thir a third feels the animal's trunk and decided it's a snake, and so on. The tale famously ends sta stating, and so this man of understand disputed loud and long, though each was partly in right, and all were in the wrong. And I think this is a metaphor that describes exactly what is going on in Mexico regarding public security policy. <coughs> in view of the rise in violence during the Calderon's years, the state responded by using the only institution that was strong enough to face large criminal organization, the military. The Calderon administration assured that this was a temporary measure aimed at giving the states and munici municipalities affected by crime some relief, and more importantly, time to rebuild their own police forces. In practice, some states did but most relied on federal help to cope with crime. The incentive was clear. If things got better, governors could reap the benefits by saying they were working side by side with the federal government. If things got worse, they could always blame the federal government for implementing the wrong strategy. Mm -hmm. And this happened in many states where things got worse before they got any better. In, in, the slide, in this slide, we can appreciate how the violence expanded across the Mexico state, particularly the border states. For example, as you can see in the chart, in Chihuahua, the homicide rate per 100,000 inhabitants reached 182 victims 
in 2010, in Sinaloa 84 and Durango, Durango 66, very, very high rates of violence. Enrique Peña Nieto won the 2000 election, 2012 election. Among his campaign promises was to ensure that peace could return to Mexico. Once in office, his administration stressed they will not rely on the use of force, meaning the military, to fight crime. Instead, they claim they will use a new strategy based on prevention, intelligence, and cooperation with local governments. The question is if we really have a change in the strategy, or do we receive old wine in new bottles? The so-called change in the strategy has not been reflected in the budget or in the creation of new public policy programs at the federal level. The 11 policy lines that the Peña Nieto administration pointed out from the beginning are just the same as those of Calderón's administration. In fact, 95% of the responsibilities and functions of the Ministry of Public Security were simply transferred to the Ministry of Government, SEGOV, when they, when they merge. In fact, this is, a, this, this is the single most important decision that the current administration has launched, the fusion of these two ministries. Mm -hmm. Moreover, 16 of the Ministry of Public Security programs were maintained under SEGOV, and only four new programs were created since 2013. These programs are PRONAPRED, the National Program of Crime Prevention, uh, Gendarmería, a new division within the Federal Police, and two additional minor programs, all of them with a very limited budget impact. So public debate has been centered on the old versus the new strategy, strategy against crime and violence. In fact, Enrique Peña Nieto has faced the same challenges as Calderón and has resorted to the same mechanisms and institutions that were available to his predecessor. If anything, Peña Nieto has changed the political discourse on the fight against crime but not the strategy. Several, but several of those have eroded administration credibility. Mexican citizens perceive corruption to be with widespread in Peña Nieto administration. Several conflict of interest scandals have hit the reputation of the president and that of his closest ministers. The Chapo Guzman's capture didn't improve the government's popularity, but his escape was a fatal blow to its credibility. The disappearance of, of the 43 students from Ayotzinapa revealed that local police forces are as corrupt as several in some states. So the choice made by, by Peña Nieto administration has been clear, centralize even more the design and implementation of public security policy. The country was divided in, into five regions to ensure that, that states follow similar strategies. A national anti-abduction commission was created to coordinate efforts against this crime. Any state in deep trouble, like Michoacán or Guerrero, and up under the control of federal forces, like the Army, Navy, and federal police, whenever crime and violence spiral out of control. And President <coughs> Peña Nieto proposed a new law to dissolve municipal police forces and absorb them into 32 state-level police corps in what is called Mango Unico, 
or unified command. From my perspective, it is not inte an intelligent bet to do the same thing expecting different outcomes. And that is what we have, do we have done in the last years. We need to launch a new gener generation of security policies, one supported by good diagnosis and evidence one oriented to create state capaci capacities where they are weak or don't exist. So, where do we go now? As complex as the problem may look, the role of think tanks is to advance solutions to policy problems. That is what we aim to do. Mm -hmm. <coughs> We decided to analyze violence and crime in Mexico from a different perspective in an attempt to contribute with analysis to new policy approaches to the problem. What did we do? A close-up close of violence and crime. Hmm? A zoom in from the national to the city level and look at what is happening in six, 16 age cities in six crimes that are at the top concern of Mexican citizens. Intentional homicide, car theft, violent assault, rape, extortion, abduction. We employed principal components analysis, a proper statistical technique to generate indexes, in order to capture the aggregate incidence of crime rates across cities. Overall, this design helped us to assess how violence is manifesting in each, in each city of the country and to develop a typology to classify cities based on its criminal, criminological patterns. The result of the principal components analysis reveal the mix of crimes that dominate each city, which allow us to typecast the incidence of each component into two main crime dimensions. The first dimension is composed of organized crime violence, intentional homicide, car theft, abduction, and extortion. And the top cities in terms of violence measured in this dimension are the ones shown in the, in the chart. Chilpancingo Guerrero, Cuernavaca, Morelos, Victoria, Tamaulipas, Acapulco, Guerrero, Culiacán, Sinaloa, Cuautla, Morelos, Morelia, Michoacán, Tampico, Tamaulipas, Cancún, Quintana Roo, y Nuevo Laredo, Tamaulipas. The second dimension is related to interpersonal violence violent assault and rape. Measuring in this way, a very different map of violence emerges. The top cities are Cancun, Guanajuato, Tula, Villahermosa, Mérida, Cuauta, Oaxaca, Tolunga, Toluca, Tianguistengo, La Paz. We, so we created a two-dimensional map which places cities based on their levels, levels of violence in each dimension. The horizontal axis shows organized crime related violence. The vertical axis, the interpersonal ones. The first quadrant, upper right, displays cities high in both dimensions. The second quadrant, upper left, displays cities low in dimension one but high in dimension two. The third quadrant, lower left, displays Display seat is low in both in both dimensions, and the last quadrant, lower right, shows those which are high in dimension one but low in dimension two. It is important to acknowledge that many Mexican cities are in good shape. Uh, this is the sh same slide showing some selected cities. What can be concluded from what we analyze? 
that first of all, not me all Mexico is in flames. On the contrary, we found that most violence is contained in a few urban areas. Second, that we have to pay more attention to interpersonal violence. As we saw in the previous map, there are cities free of drug-related violence, but largely, largely affected by, by violent assault and rape. That we have to, another finding is that we have to have locally based responses. As different cities face different type of, types of violence, local, tailor-made responses are necessary to reduce crime rates. We need to stronger accountability. The current centralized model dilutes responsibility and delegates upward. Majors and governors have had to be accountable. We need better data. Official crime statistics are more abundant now than in the past, but a lot of work is necessary to improve their quality, availability, and opportunity at a micro level. In fact, we have a hard time doing this, this type of analysis because quality of, of municipal information is not good enough to, to, to have sound conclusions and findings. Looking forward, at Mexico Evalua, we are already working on a hyper-local targeted strategy for homicide reduction tailored to fit not, not at a municipal level, but at the neighborhoods, streets, and even in specific points where, there is, where, kind, where, where crime is happening. What I'm showing you is a homicide hotspot map of Iztapalapa, an area in Mexico City that is witness to one out of every five murders in Mexico City. And this special statistical analysis reveals that not all hotspots are equal. As you can see, as you can observe on the map, some spots flare up and down in different points in time. Some pop up once, never to be seen again. We call them temporary uh, 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 hotspots. And some remain present across the years. There's chronic hotspots. The underlying causes behind temporary and chronic hotspots are vastly different, though the strategies to, com to combat them should be as well. Mm -hmm. There are crime-generating and crime-deterring locations. It's another lesson of, of the, the analysis we are uh, undertaking. In Estapalapa, the Reclusorio Oriente prison and the Central Marker are two such locations where homicides tend to cluster. White spots should be studied too. There is an important intramunicipal variance in homicide rates, and although looking at homicide hotspots give us relevant information, we need to learn from what we are doing right as well. Police implications. How can hotspots help us? We are using hotspot analysis in Iztapalapa to create a tailored homicide reduction program based on the following principles. First, homicide det deterrence by identifying and tackling environmental risk factors. Second, hotspot policing to skillfully allocate limited resources. And the third point, community-based approach that involves the community in a participatory way to promote ownership of the homicide reduction strategy and ensure its sustain sustainability. What will we do in the future? strengthen our, our lines of research in security and justice issues, fight for better data to improve our analysis and policy recommendations, 
push the em envelope incorporating leading edge evidence-based security strategies, insist, insist on transparency and accountability at all levels of governments. I think that uh, we have come to the time to change conversation and to start working in, in, in security stra strategies that are evidence-based and, and scientific that is support. That is our aim and that is what our analysis aim to, to influence poli policy security issues in Mexico. Thank you very much.